Chapter 4 Tom arrives at St. Mars and makes the acquaintance of John Green, under circumstances not entirely grateful to that interesting character. Look out, Tom! That's Pawnee Creek! Tom thrust his head out of the window and saw a small, picturesque stone bridge passing over the ghost of a stream of water. He had hardly time to catch one glimpse of it when his hat blew off, dropping straight down into the bed of Pawnee Creek. He drew in his head mournfully. "'I guess traveling is pretty expensive,' he growled. "'There's twenty-five cents for caramels, one dollar and ten cents for railroad candy that made me sick, eighty-five cents for oranges, a dollar and a half to that conductor for his old lantern, and a new hat to Pawnee Creek.' "'Oh, you can get your hat back easily enough. "'It's only a short walk from the college. "'Now, keep your eyes open one minute,' continued Harry. "'See,' he added a few minutes later, "'see that road leading along by the hedge? "'Many's the time I've taken a walk on it. "'Hullo, there's the good old white fence. "'Now we are passing the college grounds.' "'Tom had scarcely time to take a fair look at the fence "'when the train came to a standstill "'in front of a large four-story brick building,' with the words, St. Mars College, crowning its brow. Fronting the building was a spacious garden, diversified by several winding and shady walks. Fronting the garden was a high white fence, and fronting the high white fence were some hundred and odd boys with a few professors, awaiting the old scholars and new from the train. But Tom took no notice of all these things, his ears, eyes, feelings, his whole being seemed to be concentrated on the professor standing nearest him. The long black cassock and cincture were something new to him, and so great was his astonishment that the loud cheers of the boys, the fierce whistling of the locomotive, the sharp cry of, All aboard! followed by the departure of the train, might, as far as he was concerned, have happened at the other end of the world. Harry, who had left him to shake hands with some of his friends, found him, a few minutes later, standing in exactly the same position. "'Wake up, Tom!' he cried, slapping his friend on the back. This touch snapped the charm. "'I say, Harry!' he at length burst out. "'For goodness's sake! Look at that fellow with the gown on! Isn't he a sight?' "'Oh, what a greenhorn you are!' said Harry, with an easy air of superiority. "'That's not a gown. It's a cassock. And the man in it is your boss. He's the prefect of the small boys.' Tom's face expressed about two closely written pages of astonishment. "'Does he always wear that... that thing?' "'Yes. Come on up, and I'll introduce you.' "'But does he really wear it all the time?' "'That's what I said.' "'Gracious! I'm glad of that. I'd like to see him catch me if I want to run. Ha!' He looks for all the world like an old lady. "'You'll find out pretty soon whether he can run or not,' retorted Harry a little sharply. "'As to being an old lady, you'll change your mind mightily if you try any of your tricks on him.' "'Mr. Middleton,' he continued, addressing himself to the subject of these remarks, "'here's another St. Louis boy, my friend Tommy Playfair.' The prefect, with a smile and a word of welcome, cordially shook Tom's hand, at the same time bestowing such a clear, penetrating look upon the chubby, upturned face that, as Tom afterwards declared, Mr. Middleton seemed to see clear through his sailor shirt, way back to his shirt collar on the other side. "'You're a wild colt, I suppose?' "'Not so very wild, sir,' said Tom, in his gentlest tones. "'Is he as lively as you, Harry?' asked the prefect. "'I'm not going to be wild any more, Mr. Middleton.' returned Harry in all meekness. Indeed, the subdued air that had come over Harry now that he stood in the presence of his prefect was something wonderful. "'Well, Harry,' continued Mr. Middleton, "'you may take care of your new friend yourself for the present. I see some newcomers over there who appear to be very timid and ill at ease. They are quite lost.' And he hastened away to do the honours to the five Jones boys." Tom and Harry, left to themselves, sauntered leisurely up the garden walk, the former all eyes for his new surroundings. "'What's that long, low, frame shanty to our right?' asked Tom. 
That's the infirmary. When you get sick, you go there and lay up for repairs. Looks kind of snug. Yes, but when a fellow's getting just well enough to enjoy the jam and buttered toast, they turn him out. This large four-story brick building in front of us is where the fathers and prefects have their rooms. The lower floor of it on the east side, though, is the refectory for us little boys. You know there are two yards, two refectories, two study halls, and two washrooms, and four dormitories, so as to keep little boys and big boys apart. The large room just above the refectory is our study hall. Now come on over to our washroom, and we'll wash and brush up before dinner. They turned to the right, on reaching the railed steps leading up to the brick building, and passed between the infirmary on one side, and, on the other, a substantial three-story structure of stone, which, as Harry informed Tom, was the classroom building. Continuing straight on, they passed through a double gate, generally ajar, by the way, and found themselves in an open playground about four hundred feet long by two hundred wide. "'This is the small boy's yard,' volunteered Harry. "'Yes?' queried Tom, plaintively. "'Does a fellow have to stay around here all the time?' "'All the time if he doesn't behave himself. "'But come on, let's hurry in before the rush.' Beside the gate, at their right, and next to the classroom building, stood a two-story frame house, the upper floor of which was a dormitory and the lower a washroom. On entering, a novel scene presented itself to Tom's eyes. With the exception of one plane and two shovelboard tables and a few benches, the main body of the room was devoid of all furniture and other obstruction. But lining the four walls, all around was a series of small boxes with hinged doors, each box divided into an upper and lower partition, used for keeping of soaps, brushes, toilet articles, and the like, and above the boxes were scattered towels, soap, and tin basins in all manner of ungraceful confusion, the towels, for the most part, dangling from a water-pipe, ornamented with here and there a faucet. At the time that our two friends entered, there were a few boys in the room, engaged at their ablutions, while a prefect, notebook in hand, was giving each boy on his entrance one of the many boxes. "'How do, Mr. Phelan?' said Harry, tipping his hat and shaking hands with his superior. "'Why, Harry, so here you are again.' "'Yes, Mr. Phelan, I'm like a bad penny.' "'In one sense, yes,' said Mr. Phelan, "'but you're too modest. I'm delighted to see you again.' "'and I see you have a new friend. "'Who is this?' "'This is Tommy Playfair, Mr. Phelan. "'And I say, can't I have my old box again, "'same as last year? "'It was near that window, you know. "'And can't Tom Playfair have the one next to me? "'I'm the only boy here that he knows.' "'Mr. Phelan, who had in the meantime "'taken Tom's hand with a smile of welcome, "'assented to Master Harry's requests. "'Thank you, sir,' said Harry effusively, and he conducted Tom to a box, number twenty-nine, near the window he had pointed out in the making of his petition. "'This is number twenty-nine, my box, Tom, and here's yours next to mine, number thirty. But Tom was not satisfied. "'That little box for me?' he exclaimed. "'Why, of course,' Harry responded. "'You don't want the earth, do you?' Without making any answer to this important question, Tom walked over to the prefect. "'I say, Mr. Phelan, can't I have another box besides the one you've given me?' "'Why? What have you to say against the box I gave you?' "'Oh, that's all right, but I want two boxes.' "'Indeed. What do you want two boxes for?' "'Well, you see, I want one for my books, you know.' "'Oh,' said the prefect, breaking into a smile, "'you'll get a desk in the study hall for them.' "'Oh, that's it, is it?' and Tom, satisfied with his information, rejoined Harry Quip, who, with his eyes bulging out of his head, had been watching Tom's proceedings in utmost astonishment. In the meantime, the washroom had been rapidly filling. Every other moment witnessed the appearance of new faces. Among those that entered, some, notably the Jones boys, were timid beyond description. Others, like Tom, were quite tranquil and self-possessed. Others, again, were rather bold and undoubtedly noisy. The latter class aroused Tom's curiosity. "'I say, Harry,' he inquired, 
Who are those fellows in here that talk so loud and lift up their shoulders when they walk around and go on as if they own the whole place? Shh! Don't talk so loud, Tom, said Harry with unaffected seriousness. There are a few of the old boys. You see, they're perfectly at home. They're apt to be pretty hard on newcomers. Are all the old boys that way? was Tom's next question. Well, not all, but a great many are. These questions and answers afford considerable insight into the economy of boarding school life. We hear and read a great deal about the easy confidence, nay, boldness, of old servants, old clerks, and the like, but what are they all compared to the old student at boarding school? As a newcomer, he may be the most timid, the most meek of mortals. The first few weeks of his changed life he may rarely speak above a whisper. But with the rolling months, as he picks up a friend or so, evidences of ease and natural bearing insinuate themselves into his address. At the end of the term he departs, it may be a quiet, gentlemanly boy. But, vacation over, lo, he returns as one of the owners of earth and sky, with all assurance and arrogance attributed by the American press to a plumber in midwinter. Every look, every tone, every gesture proclaims in terms unmistakable that he is an old boy, that he knows more about life in any phase than a newcomer, that he is up to every conceivable turn of a schoolboy fortune, that a new boy, how naturally gifted soever, is but an inferior sort of creature, and that, in fine, there is nothing, humanly speaking, in the heavens above, or the earth beneath, or in the waters under the earth, that can compare with that supremest of mortals, the old boy. It would be an injustice, however, to let the reader suppose that all old boys belong to this class. Not so, quite a goodly number, are as polite, unpretending, gentlemanly, and sensible as the most refined newcomer. Johnny Green was an old boy of the former class. For the last five or six minutes he had been making himself very conspicuous in the washroom by talking in a raised voice, whenever the prefect was out of hearing, of the way he had got ahead of the old man, as he irreverently termed his father, of the great and disgusting number of new kids that had already appeared in the washroom, and of their uncommonly disagreeable appearance, which Master Green put down as being rather green. Having completed his toilet, which consisted chiefly, and indeed almost exclusively, in so arranging his hair, as to conceal almost entirely his freckled forehead, John Green stationed himself at the narrow door of the washroom, where he amused himself at such odd times as the attending prefect's preoccupation allowed by tripping up various little newcomers as they chanced to leave or enter. Tom and Harry were now going out, and Green was anxiously awaiting his new victim. Harry advanced first, and, being an old boy, was allowed to pass unmolested. Then came Tom, who, by the way, had been watching Master Green's little practical joke for fully five minutes. As Tom was verging upon the threshold, Green put out his foot. Suddenly a howl arose from the bully's mouth. "'Why, good gracious!' exclaimed Tom, turning on his steps. "'Did I walk on your foot? But really, what a big foot you've got!' "'You wretched little fool!' roared the bully, who was now hopping about with a combination of earnestness and liveliness, exhilarating to see. "'You've stepped on at least five of my corns!' "'That's too bad,' Tom made answer with his face screwed into its most serious expression. "'But all the farmers say there's going to be a large corn crop this year.' With this consolatory reflection, he passed on arm in arm with Harry Quip, who was struggling, but with sorry success, to keep a straight face, leaving the discomfited Master Green to continue or conclude his dance as he pleased. Adjoining the end of the washroom there was, and is yet doubtless, a small shed under whose protecting cover were a turning pole, a pair of parallel bars, and a few other articles of gymnastics, and a line of benches. Upon one of these latter our two friends seated themselves, calmly awaiting the welcome sound of the dinner bell. But the calm, how often history repeats itself, proved to be the forerunner of a storm. 
Scarcely had they composed themselves in their seats when John Green, who was wearied of dancing and anxious to meet Tom in a place beyond sight of all prefects, turned the corner. Leisurely leaning his head on his left arm, his left arm on one of the parallel bars, and placing his right hand on his hip, he had made a special study of this special attitude during vacation, he fastened a stern gaze upon Tom. Notwithstanding, our hero seemed oblivious to Green's presence. "'I say,' began the bully, when he realized that both pose and gaze had shot wide of the mark, "'are there any more like you at home?' "'I don't know, I'm sure,' answered Tom with suavete. "'But if you wish, I'll write home and ask.' At this retort, three or four newcomers who were sitting nearby and had been gazing about listlessly broke into a titter. The bully glared at them ferociously, whereupon their faces fell into length again, and a faraway look, the symptom of homesickness, came into their eyes. Harry had laughed, too, but his laugh met with no rebuke. He was an old boy, and in consequence was entitled to the privilege. Encouraged by the power of his eye, Master Green turned it in full force upon Tom, and again addressed himself to that unterrified youth. "'What's your name, Sonny?' Tom's face assumed a troubled expression. He passed his hand over his forehead and through his hair, then, after a pause, made an answer. "'Can't remember it just now.' My memory's bad when the weather's warm. It's an awful long name. It took the priest over five minutes to get it in the day I was baptized. Another titter from the listeners and a loud laugh from Harry. But Green was too astonished at the coolness of the newcomer to check this outburst. I suppose, continued Green with excessive irony, that you think you're funny. I guess I do, answered Tom blandly. All the family say I am. When I was home, they'd never let me go to funerals for fear I'd make them laugh in the solemn parts. A prolonged giggle and a louder laugh. You're terribly smart, exclaimed the withering green, who, forgetting his pose, was now quite stiff and bolt upright. Smart, echoed Tom. Why, now you're hitting the nail right on the head. The fellows back at school I tended last year said they wouldn't come back if I did, because I always carried off all the premiums. That's why I came here. "'You'd better shut your mouth, or I'll hit you one,' vociferated the bully, drowning the laughter evoked by this last retort. And as he spoke, he pulled up the arms of his coat, revealing in the act a pair of cuffs with many flashing cuff buttons. "'Oh, if you're going to strike,' pursued Tom, with all the placidity of a mid-spring zephyr, "'I think I'd better shut my mouth, or you might poke your fist down my throat, and then I'd be sick for life.' In this quick rejoinder, there was to the spectators gazing upon Green's clenched fist a certain obviousness of point. Consequently, it aroused mirth in all the listeners and rage in the heart of a bully. "'You're a coward!' he foamed. "'That's what you say,' said Tom. "'And a sneak!' "'That's what you say.' "'And a mule thief!' "'I never stole you!' This was too much for Green. He made a spring at Tom, but Harry caught his arm. "'Hold on, Green,' said Harry. "'Just take a boy of your size.' Harry and Tom, it should be remarked, were each a year or two younger than Green. "'Let me go, will you?' shouted the bully. "'No, I won't.' Suddenly John Green became very quiet, jumped upon the parallel bars, and began swinging up and down. Mr. Middleton had just turned the corner." Harry broke into a whistle while Tom maintained his blandness to the end. Before hostilities could be renewed, the bell rang for dinner. "'You took him in great shape, Tom,' observed Harry on the way to the refectory. "'Where did you get that cool way of saying things?' "'Oh, I used to have a great many rows with my uncle. He got me so as I couldn't get excited. All the same, you'd better keep your eyes open. Green will pay you back for your talk before long. Anyhow, if I'm around or any decent old fellow, you'll be all right.' He's a coward and a mean boy, and if he caught you alone, he'd be sure to take it out on you. But he won't tackle us together. They were now at the door of the refectory. As each student entered, Mr. Middleton assigned him his place at one of the ten tables, each of these being laid for twelve. To their regret, Harry and Tom were placed at different tables. Dinner passed off quietly. For the thanks had been returned, Mr. Middleton announced that each boy should— 
immediately on leaving the refectory, go to the room of the prefect of studies, where he would learn his class and obtain a list of the books which he should procure from the procurator, or, being translated, the buyer. Tom and Harry, who contrived to have their interview with the prefect of studies at the same time, were both assigned to the class of rudiments, a class where the student is prepared to enter upon the study of Latin. They managed to get their books about the same time, too, and so, to their undisguised delight, Mr. Middleton appointed them seats next to each other in the hall of studies. "'Tom, this is just glorious!' exclaimed Harry, as they emerged from the study room. "'We're in the same class, and we're right next to each other for studies. But look here. While you were getting your books, and I was outside waiting for you, I heard something. Do you know the first thing Green is going to do to you?' "'No. What?' Why, the first chance he gets today, he's going to pin a paper on your back with the words, Kick me, I am a fool, on it. He's waiting his chance now in the yard, I think. Tom stood still and gave himself up for a few seconds to reflection. Then he resumed his walk and observed, We'll fix him if he tries it, Harry. I'll tell you what, we'll let him go pretty far with this joke. I won't notice him. "'But when he gets behind me and is pinning it on me, "'you take out your handkerchief, will you? "'Of course, you'll be standing in front and facing me. "'What'll you do? "'You'll see. "'He won't enjoy the joke very much, anyhow.' "'No sooner had the boys entered the yard "'than they noticed that John Green was eyeing them closely. "'He's waiting his chance,' whispered Harry. "'Just so,' answered Tom. "'Say, let's go down by the handball alley.' Harry acquiesced, and both made their way to the further end of the yard. Harry, with his hands in his pockets, leaned against the body of the alley so as to take in the whole playground, while Tom, also hands in pockets, stood facing Harry, commanding a view of nothing save what was included in the two walls of the alley. Green, in the meantime, was following in their wake with stealthy steps. Even Tom could divine this from the expression on Harry's countenance. At length, Green had secured a suitable position for pinning on the placard. He stooped, for with Harry drew out his handkerchief. "'Talking of jumping!' exclaimed Tom at once. "'How's this?' and he gave a sharp backward kick with his right foot. Green received the full force of this on his shins. The tenderest part of him, perhaps, by the law of compensation for his head, was within a little of being actually impregnable, both as to blows and to ideas.' On the moment, Green testified his presence by a prolonged howl. "'Good gracious!' Tom exclaimed, turning around and addressing Green, who, with both hands, was holding one knee and hopping enthusiastically, with the only foot he had at liberty. "'How in the world did you come to be behind me? You're terribly unlucky, ain't you?' A crowd of boys, who had been watching Green's ill-timed attempt to fasten on the placard, were now shouting and laughing as they hurried down the yard to take in, in fuller detail, the victim's lively and novel dance. "'Does it hurt?' asked Tom compassionately as he picked up the placard, which Green had allowed to fall upon the ground. "'Does it hurt?' bawled Green, suspending his dance to give full effect to the answer. "'Oh, no, it doesn't hurt at all. It's awful pleasant, you fool!' and with this burst of eloquence he resumed his dancing. "'I say, what's this?' inquired Tom, holding the placard at arm's length and scanning it critically. "'Is this your paper?' "'Yes, and I wished you and that paper were in Halifax.' The intense devotion of this sentiment was beyond doubt. "'But,' pursued Tom, "'you've got Kick Me written on it, so you've got what you want. And are you really and truly a fool?' This question so angered Green that he lost sight of his pain. Releasing his injured leg, he made a savage rush at Tom. But this time, too, his intentions were frustrated. George Keenan, a boy who had attended St. Mars for several years, and who, judging by his modesty, didn't seem to know it, caught the aggressor's arm with a grip which elicited another howl. "'Leave him alone, Green. He served you right. You've got no business to be picking on boys under your size every chance you get.' And look here, you'd better not touch him while John Donnell or I am around. And George walked away. The bully was too crestfallen to face his fellow students. 
Scowling and shamefaced, he hobbled off to the infirmary to get his leg painted with iodine. George Keenan, who has here entered upon the scene, merits a few words. He was a model boy, not the kind of model boy that figures in many tales for the young, but such a model as you may expect to meet with occasionally, nay, God be thanked for it, oftentimes in real life. At baseball, running, handball, football, and all manner of athletic games, no one was more skilled than George. He was small, undergrown for his years, and slightly made, still his strength was unquestioned. And yet no one had ever known George to exert his strength for mean or low purposes. No one had ever known him to use his influence for aught save what was ennobling. He was everybody's friend. With him the bad were, for the nonce, good, and the good were better. Withal he was cheerful, jocose, and a bit of a wag. He made his way through life with the brightness and wholesomeness of a sunbeam. Nor is George, among the general run of boarding-school students, an isolated character. In every well-conducted boarding-school there are hearts as warm and minds as noble. These boys are themselves the least self-conscious of mortals. Though they know it not, they are doing work, and good work too, for the Lord and Saviour, whom in the nobility of their hearts they love with manly tenderness.' 